Day, right here on MTV, the world's first video music channel. Party's over, kid. Nobody lives forever! G.I. Joe, at 4.30, futuristic intergalactic combat with the Transformers. Hey, Doc, we better back up. We don't have enough roads to get up to 88. Roads? Well, we're going, we don't need roads. is about excess everything to the extreme which pretty much means the same thing uh kick-ass music and boobs babes and explosions well the 80s was really great for a lot of different things i mean uh it had some of the most innovative original style of music because 70s was full of a lot of different styles but um in the 80s what had started with the punk movement uh, became the new wave movement. Along with that came these new maverick directors, uh, you know, who had uh, started in the 70s, but uh, didn't really kick in until the 80s. And so we got all these these new styles of music and, and uh, filmmaking. Uh, stories that were old, but were being told because we were a decade out of Vietnam. And we didn't have to come across so cynical. We could make things fun again. I think what was very exciting about the movies of the 80s was just the simple diversity of the stories that were being told. Like, you, it seemed like coming out of the 70s with the advent of new effects technologies, for instance, the summer of 82, in a period of two months, we got Poltergeist, Star Trek II, John Carpenter's The Thing, Tron, Blade Runner, E.T., but soon to compete are some very dazzling science fiction films. Today, we sneak preview a few. First up, Blade Runner. Directed by Ridley Scott, who directed Alien, Blade Runner is a detective thriller set in a very crowded Los Angeles in the year 2019. Stars Harrison Ford as a bounty hunter who tracks down four deadly genetically manufactured human beings with superhuman strength. Time to die. The film has that dark, wet look of Alien and is filled with colorful characters, fancy technology, and flying cars. Playing Ford's love interest is Sean Young as a very lovely, genetically manufactured woman. Blade Runner is set for release on June 25th. Stop where you are! Turn away from it! Back to the present day, MGM has Poltergeist for release on June 4th. This Steven Spielberg production is about a suburban family terrorized in their spooky new house. With its flashy special effects and ghost-can-do-anything attitude, Poltergeist is anxiously awaited by those who like to have the heck scared out of them. They're here. Also from the mind of Steven Spielberg is E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Little is known about this film except that it stars a friendly alien lost and alone 100,000 light years from home. He's befriended by a small Earth boy. An extension of Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T. is heavy in visual effects. It's set for release on June 4th.
Another alien from outer space is featured in The Thing, but this one isn't so friendly. Based on the same short story used by Howard Hawks to make The Thing in 1952, this version stars Kurt Russell. It's an all-male cast battling a deadly creature which can take on the appearance of any living life form. The movie has plenty of ice, blood, and things that go bump in the night. The Thing is escaping its icy coffin June 25th. There she is. Starring the original cast from the TV series Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan looks to be the movie Trekkies have been waiting light years for. Filled with lots of action and danger, Star Trek II features Ricardo Montalbaum as the vengeful Khan who sets out to kill Captain Kirk and destroy whoever gets in his way. One of the main features of this sequel is the ending where the beloved Mr. Spock meets his end. But of course, in science fiction, nobody really dies. Star Trek II should beam your way June 4th. And finally, in a bold move to get the kids out of video arcades and back into the theaters, Disney Studios is offering Tron. It's a futuristic adventure fantasy combining computer-generated images with live-action photography. Tron stars Jeff Bridges as a computer genius caught in a battle in a world of video games. Hoping to cash in on some of the billions popped into video arcades, Disney is throwing Tron out to the audience on July 9th. All in two months. And these films were all so different. And they took us to places, well, inside a computer, like with Tron, or in a future where there were replicants that were exact duplicates of human beings that were being hunted down by special Blade Runner units. You just never knew what you were going to get. And I think what was really exciting was that filmmakers were challenged to try all kinds of new things. It seemed like no stories were left unturned. If you wanted to go back to the Sumerian age, you could get Arnold Schwarzenegger to play Conan. A lot of people point to certain eras. I think the 80s really was a golden age of cinema to a lot of degrees. I mean, you had more quality movies coming out within a short within a short time span. There was one summer where you had Karate Kid, Indiana Jones, Gremlins, and Ghostbusters. And that was in one summer. That was 1984. <laughs> I mean, come on. It's an embarrassment of riches. And then the, the year later, you had Back to the Future. So I the, really, I think the 80s was, a, it was a, apart from the bad hair and the bad clothes, I mean, there was it was a time that's going to be very difficult to replicate in terms of actual movies. Plus, they were, I think they were more willing to just kind of take take chances because a lot of the studios were owned by beverage companies and and corporate uh, bodies and entities. And they say, oh, yeah, here's, here's $20 million. Go make your movie. So they could take a chance on a thing like uh, Ghostbusters. That was screwy or Gremlins. 80s movies are awesome. Everything about the 80s was inventive and exciting and fun. Every genre got to have a great time. Horror had amazing 80s movies coming out during the decade. Action movies during the 80s were some of the best that have ever been made. Sci-fi movies from the 80s are fantastic. I mean, there's so much to love about 80s films. I mean, the 80s means everything to me. I mean, the 80s is when I grew up. It's what formed me. Just about every favorite movie I have came out in the 80s, aside from maybe Jaws and a few others we got some of the best entertainment ever not just in movies but in television and music like i said but uh no the 80s were great um of course i don't know economically <laughs> i wasn't an adult yet um but i did enjoy the entertainment that's for sure i think as we moved through the 80s both the studios and the filmmakers felt that they had a little bit more leeway to try and do things that they might not have done in decades past and so if you wanted to have a time traveling delorean you could you know if you wanted to go from beyond or have dr herbert west reanimate corpses in reanimator you could i mean there was nothing there that was either forbidden whether you couldn't try it uh i think the filmmakers were game to do just about anything and whether it was big budget studio movies or whether it was low-budget B-movies, uh, there was so much exciting filmmaking going on that it made the whole era just incredibly dynamic and fun to, well, certainly from a viewing standpoint, to go to the movies. We had uh, all these vampire and sci-fi films, 
Roger Corman was at his peak for making low budget sci fi because so much had come out that they could borrow from. So some of the most innovative films were borrowed from stuff from the 70s that made it more fun. And uh, it was a very colorful period. So there was a lot of colors. Um, some of my favorites, like Gremlins, of course, came out in the 80s and Ghostbusters, uh, Back to the Future. Just a lot of great films. Uh, the, the era was just full of uh, just vibrance. That's one thing I remember about the 80s was everything was vibrant and colorful and lively. A lot of liveliness. It was an era that people felt good about themselves and they felt good about their entertainment. There wasn't necessarily any, it wasn't overly preachy. They felt, if I was going to see a movie, there's a ch good, good chance I'm going to see something I like. It's hard to get one quality movie in a summer. We had five at one point. So I don't know if we've ever had a time like that since. Because as marketing departments took over and movies became more and more expensive, uh, the risks became much larger. And in the 80s, the risks were still manageable. And that's why I think you were able to see movies like a, a director like John McTiernan could make a weird horror film like Nomads, then wind up making Predator, then make Die Hard, and then make Hunt for Red October. And it was it was just a time where people were able to develop their careers over multiple films because they weren't shooting for the moon. You didn't, you know, movies weren't a hundred million dollars then. They were a lot cheaper. And so when you'd go to the movies to see something, you know, they hadn't bet the studios hadn't bet the farm on one or two movies a year. They were releasing a lot of movies a year, and they were all different, different kinds of movies. And even producers like Steven Spielberg could release gremlins that he produced or indiana jones and the temple of doom that he directed in the same month or the same summer and they were very different kinds of movies and yet still crowd pleasers like we've never seen really before at the time or since uh the 80s had this weird look at things uh when i hear somebody go oh the 80s is about politics and and the power of greed. No, that came in the 90s talking about the 80s. The stuff that came out in the 80s was something new and fresh. Um, even when they did uh, borrowed ideas from the 60s and 70s, they still did it in a very innovative and fresh way. With the inventiveness, with the effects, the stories, the development of movies as a whole, you really did get to see some incredible work being done. It was just an amazing time for cinema and for creators and for actors and everyone involved. The 80s were a blast.
end is inevitable, Maverick. You kind of set it for extinction. Maybe so, sir. But not today. I think 80s movies were just great. I, I think they were fun. I think movies in the 80s just connected with people. Uh, you had an entire generation that grew up in the 80s that are right now in their working years and making movies and writing shows and doing entertainment work. And the 80s really connected with an entire wave of people. And that's what we're seeing right now. It's kind of like when you look at the 80s where guys like John Carpenter were influenced by the thing from another world from the 50s and other sci-fi and other horror and everything that was coming out in that era. They wound up growing up to be the guys who made some of our favorite movies. So now we're kind of in that period again where you're seeing everyone who grew up loving John Carpenter's The Thing from 1982, and now they're making their stuff and using it and their influences, and you wind up with stuff like Stranger Things and The Void and other stuff. I mean, you can feel the 80s in all kinds of pop culture today. I mean, these things are cyclical, of course, but, I mean, it's really hard to uh, deny how much influence the 80s have right now on all of our entertainment. Uh, of course, music and, and some of the fashions, but movies, especially most of the reboots, sequels, remakes, rehashes, what have you, uh, stem from 80s franchises uh, or even films that may have started in the, in the 70s but were real big in the 80s. Uh, you know, see things like Cobra Kai now, which clearly are rooted in the 80s uh, and really call back to that quite a bit. You got shows like the Goldbergs. Um, there's all kinds of stuff out there that are really always, you know, trying to get that 80s uh, vibe. I think the one thing about 80s movies that causes them to resonate even 35 years or even more later, we're getting all of these sequels. Cobra Kai was inspired by the Karate Kid films. Is There was a certain earnestness in the 80s. The movies, they they knew what they were. So if you were going to watch a film and you're going to meet Mr. Miyagi and you learn the lesson of wax on, wax off, it wasn't cynical. It wasn't political. It wasn't about identity politics. It wasn't about any of those things. It was just a truth unto the movie itself. The movies were, they wore their hearts on their sleeves. And you know, when you're watching The Breakfast Club, it might have been an encounter group with a bunch of disparate teens that might not in real life have ever been together. But in the context of the movie, it felt right. There was an honesty, an earnestness. Um, a, a it, it was not a cynical bone in a lot of the movies of the 80s bodies. So basically, um, a lot of your filmmakers today uh, grew up or, or were born in the 80s, and so they were um, uh, affected by the 80s and, and how it looked. And there was so much creativity in how things were being presented uh, in the 80s. And, uh, you know, horror films had a, new, a rebirth in the 80s, in particular, and sci-fi. And uh, we had finally gotten to where we could do new things in film that had never been done before. I mean, you, you take a look at something like Captain America, the first Avenger, which is uh, inspired by Indiana Jones, as far as being a period piece too. And the, the guy directed that Joe Johnston, who I think is a criminally underused director in Hollywood. He worked on um, Raiders of the Lost Ark and Indiana Jones for Lucasfilm. You have a, an aesthetic that is, I think, classic but it's difficult apart from the fashions i think it's really difficult to pin down to a specific era and there is a timelessness to something like back to the future to ghostbusters to gremlins to like i said indiana jones to star trek to the wrath of khan done like this to by design there's a timelessness to airplane which is one of my favorite movies Something about the entertainment from that time period just sticks with people. And even people who've never seen those films, one of the things I love to do uh, with what little free time I do have is to run around on uh, YouTube and find people who are young and are experiencing a lot of these films for the first time. 
And when you see somebody who's never seen Back to the Future or, you know, Beverly Hills Cop or Gremlins or what have you, it's just a a crazy uh, experience to see somebody who's never experienced it before when somebody like me who's lived with it. Like, I lived and breathed it. It was there. It was always there. Um, most of these movies and franchises, if they weren't on TV all the time, you know, we had sequels and we had, you know, all kinds of stuff. Cartoons on Saturday mornings were another thing as well that seemed to have gone away. But we had tons and tons of 80s cartoons that were based on franchises. And then look at a lot of the stuff that's today. It's so influenced by the 80s. And a lot of franchises are always coming back from the 80s. I mean, we've got a Ghostbusters movie on the way. Gremlins is supposed to be coming back. There's always talks of things like Police Academy. We got another Top Gun film. We got another Beverly Hills Cop movie on the way. I mean, any day now, I'm sure we'll get another Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street movie. There's just so many of these things and lots of John Carpenter films from the 80s are constantly getting talked about being rebooted or sequels. So I could definitely see uh, this trend going for a while. We just got another Bill and Ted movie too. I mean, when you watch something like Rambo First Blood Part Two, John Rambo came in and he's like, I know what's right. I, I know what needs to be done. We need to go back to Vietnam. We got to rescue these POWs. Are we going to get to win this time? And that's what that movie was about. That's all it was about. It was about John Rambo going out on a job, kicking ass and saving American soldiers and bringing them home. And anyone who was going to get in his way, we had no time for. And And that's one of the things that, I think the eighties, like, like even, even a movie like back to the future, you know, a movie like back to the future was a film, first of all, beautifully written. It took its central premise seriously. It examined that premise from all kinds of different angles. And it gave you one of the most satisfying screen stories and certainly one of the most perfect screen plays ever written. And it just delivered on everything it promised. So often now you go to the movies and you're like, ah, it was okay. But when you went to movies in the 80s, you'd come out of the theater thinking, man, that was awesome. Like it promised you something and it delivered on all those promises. So when you came out of the theater, you couldn't help but have a giant smile on your face and think, man, I not only have to go see that movie again, I've got to buy the VHS tape, you know, from Blockbuster or wherever. And I just think that the movies of the 80s delivered the goods and they did it in such a way that we really haven't seen since. And you're also seeing people who loved just sitting in front of the TV and watching cable and getting fed all of these amazing movies from all the different companies that were basically out there bringing us what wound up becoming our favorites or what wound up becoming the ones that we demanded. Hey, we want that on tape. We want to get that from the video store. We want to go and rent that again on Friday night and get a pizza and just have a blast. Uh, I, I think it's one of those things where there are a lot of factors that come into the reason why the 80s were so influential, especially for right now, because we're very much uh, the, the offshoot of the home video generation. You know, you had this huge change when tapes came out. So everyone was going out and getting VCRs and running videotapes on the weekends and that became a very important part of a lot of the you know weekend entertainment from everyone's family so you then see how that evolves into everything from vhs tapes to dvds to blu-rays to streaming but here we are now here we are 30 years after this amazing decade ended and we're still talking about it. We still love it. I mean, it's still, for many of us, the period where some of our favorite films exist. I even know people who won't watch movies from the 60s and 70s. They love the 80s that much. They love the 90s that much. They're like, no, 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 film peaked at this period. You've got a lot of revivals and stuff like that that are clearly coming out of the 80s because those are the stories that stick with people. And I think another big part of it was, and a reason why remakes of the, like things like Ghostbusters and The Thing and all these things that don't work is because we grew up in an era with those things on video and television all the time. Because back in the day, like say when King Kong was remade in 76, chances are you didn't really, unless you were alive when it came out, you didn't see the original King Kong. 
because it was hardly ever on television and it didn't get re-released that often. So, I mean, it's a little bit different when you have something like that or The Fly when that came out because video was just coming in. But growing up in the age of video as a kid, I mean, I watched Gremlins almost every single day. Uh, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, I remember watching all s- one summer, every, almost every day. So, I mean, it was just one of those things you could do. And I don't, you know, there wasn't a day that went by that I wouldn't flip on, you know, uh, a movie channel and, and there was something playing Superman or whatever. It was, uh, there was always something there to enjoy and have fun with. You know, 80s had this like feel to it. I mean, that, that was when, you know, even though malls came out really when I was a kid, a little kid. They didn't get big uh, until the 80s, and uh, they blew up everywhere. And um, Stranger Things in particular used the mall well. Because, like, uh, when I was young, I had a job at the at the mall. I worked at this place called Roy Rogers. And there were kids out front inside the mall breakdancing, and I went out and joined them. Yeah, I used to break dance. Don't make fun of me. And um, I knew how to do the moonwalk and all that silly stuff. Yeah, I'm just old. And... Um, but I think one of the reasons why uh, they, they also, it's not just because of the inspiration of having grown up or been a child in the 80s. It's also because today there is a lot less innovation from Hollywood. So they tend to borrow from things all the time now. This is something I've always said. There's an interview, a great interview with Frank Zappa. And where he says that during the 70s, the 60s and 70s, there was a lot of experimental music coming out. But that was a time when you had guys in suits and cigars, and they would say, I don't know what this is. Put it out. Sell it. See if it sells. Take a chance. And I think that's part of it, is that they were very willing to take chances. Obviously, they didn't know they were taking chances, but they were willing to trust these directors, these guys like the Spielbergs, like the Francis Ford Coppola's, like the Scorsese's, you know, like the Ivan Reitman's, and like the John Landis's. John Landis's? John Landis. I guess John Landis's would be would be plural, you know, because it's got an S on whatever it is. I, uh, let's not make this an English lesson. But another another movie actually, uh, like I said, Trading Places. I don't think you could make that movie today. Yeah, I got a movie that's about stocks and commodities trading, and about a poor guy and a rich guy, and they defraud billionaires out of out of the, all their money. I'm like, you couldn't make that today. I'm like, people look at you. What, what are you talking about? Stocks? No, no, no. I never never sell in the mid, never sell to the in the middle America. Never sell in China. Never work in Europe. You know. So like I said, the people were willing to take more chances back then. I think. I think for people who love practical effects, people who love um, filmmaking on celluloid and 35 millimeter and everything, uh, it was really the period where that was beginning to peak before it really started to shift. And you have a lot of nostalgia for that. You've got a lot of people out there who love the films for multiple reasons because of their technical aspects or uh they're you know growing up on it or watching it on USA up all night with Ron Shear or whatever. I mean, it's just a almost universal kind of thing for anyone who's a fan of horror, for anyone who's a fan of sci-fi, for anyone who's a fan of genre movies, the 80s really did connect and they connected in a big way. So this decade still works for us now. And that's why you see so many shows and so many movies trying to recapture that. And even music too. You see chip tunes, you see synth wave, you see uh, new retro wave, you, you see all of these things that are calling back to that time. And there's just something about it. And it's familiarity, but it always really winds up being a good time whenever you dig into some good 80s stuff. And it's always entertaining. You hope movies are great now, but maybe one or two a year are really great. But back in the 80s, it seemed like half the movies you'd go to were awesome.
I think I love 80s movies so much because I spent so much of my youth, my teen years, and my young adulthood growing up in the 80s. And the movies of the 80s were sort of the cinematic dreams that I hoped my life would sort of turn out like, <laughs> you know, if that makes any sense. I mean, maybe I was never going to be a Blade Runner, but I certainly would like to hang out with women like Sean Young. I know she wasn't real in Blade Runner, but if I could meet somebody like her, you know, in the eighties were constantly giving me, giving me visions of, of, of people and places that I wanted to either know or visit. And they would offer scenarios like, for instance, who doesn't want to see themselves as John McClane, you know, and, and take on Hans Gruber and save your wife and be reunited with your kids and, 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 and save everyone's life. That was at Nakatomi Plaza on that, ill-fated christmas eve i mean they, they and and there wasn't like it was again it was done like john mcclain wasn't an anti-hero he was a workaday blue collar cop man and he just was in the wrong place at the wrong time and that's who you wanted to be i'm like if i was in the wrong place at the wrong time i'd seen die hard i could be just like john mcclain and i would win the day you know how often do we get heroes like that anymore I mean, all of our heroes are anti-heroes. They've got problems. They've got foibles and shortcomings. But the characters, the heroes of the 80s, man, they were righteous. And they were, they were, they were do-gooders. And they weren't black and white. These people were all, they were all good. You know, they were rightfully good. They were, they were characters that I wanted to be when I grew up. I love 80s movies because I grew up with that. I love 80s films from any genre basically uh and it, it really does depend on you know whether or not it's an entertaining movie for me personally but at the same time i greatly respect films from the 80s that might not even be my thing uh there are some you know rom-coms and some uh coming of age high school movies and things like that that i'm like yeah okay whatever uh, but for me, I'm diehard horror and sci-fi and genre movies and 80s films have some of the best that were ever made. It's just undeniable that, you know, guys like Rob Bottin and Rick Baker and Stan Winston were at the peak of their abilities in creating monsters and creating effects and making memorable practical scenes that we're never going to forget. You know, there's a reason why. Rick Baker won an Oscar for An American Werewolf in London. And it's because his work was so innovative and so incredible in making that realized werewolf come to life and the transformations and the puppetry and everything that went into it that he basically set the foundation for what we have now where special effects in that category are actually a thing. It's that important that it completely redefined the way that film is appreciated. So much to look at. Uh, we had great spy movies. Uh, the Timothy Dalton era really was the best of James Bond. Uh, we had a lot of great movies, um, uh, some of the best horror films that I had seen since the Hammer era uh, came out in the 80s. Uh, uh, you know, An American Werewolf in London, uh, the Lost Boys in particular, two, two very influential, The Howling, oh my God, uh, just some of the most influential f by filmmakers that have been around since the 60s. But the 80s is when they really got to to let loose with some of this stuff. And and in horror, we were, we were getting gore like we had gotten before the 70s. And uh, the things had changed theatrically in how things were, were uh, allowed to be. You know, some of it was good and some of it was bad, thanks to Spielberg and the MPAA. But uh, we did get some great horror and great gore effects. And gore effects had really gone a long way since when uh, the 60s and early 70s. There was no more orange colored blood. It was like very realistic gore. And the, the uh, prosthetic effects uh, done by guys like Rick Baker and, and Rob Boutine, you know, it was just amazing. It's hard to pick something that sticks out about 80s movies that's different than any other era. Because uh, there's so many things. Um, you know, you see a movie from the 30s or the 40s or the 50s and the 60s and 70s, you kind of, 
instantaneously recognize it just like a film from the eighties, but something changed in that era uh, that really came out of the seventies. And that was that maverick uh, nature of the directors and the editing styles and the independent features that we were getting and that independent spirit really that kind of permeated throughout those films. Um, Cause I mean, we talk about all the time on our, our YouTube channels about how, you know, nowadays we'd never, never get a lot of these films and not just because of the political aspect, but you know, first of all, so much of it would be done in computer and, and a lot of the storytelling that came out of necessity because you know, they couldn't do a lot of the things that we could eventually do with like Lord of the Rings and Jurassic Park and all that. Like at that point, it was just, uh, you know, imagination had to take its course and you had to work with what you had. And sometimes, the, you know, the, the mother of invention is, uh, you know, limitations and trying to work around those things. And I mean, the thing with the 80s that always just they, almost every movie always had a happy ending. And not always, but, you know, it generally did uh, in, in a sense that it always felt satisfactory. You ever had that favorite jacket, that favorite piece of clothing, your favorite jeans, you put it on, it just feels like it's part of you. That's what I think 80s movies are to a lot of people. The, you know them inside and out. You know the, the stories behind them. You know that. This is a time that you can't replicate. There's a great story, actually, from um, from the episode Relics uh, from the Next Generation. You know, and then Scotty tells you know he comes back. He's they have a they toast a drink to the Enterprise and the Stargazer. Old girlfriends will never meet again. That's what it's like. I mean, you. I don't want to say it's pure nostalgia. But it brings you to that time, and it gives you that warm feeling. 80s movies are entertaining. They are fun as hell. You've got so many great favorites across the board. And for me, I watch horror year-round. I watch sci-fi year-round. I will go back and revisit my favorites all the time because that's why they're my favorites. I love revisiting movies from the 80s that are great, that are engaging, that are entertaining, that are exciting, that are just a blast to see and rewatch. I mean, the other day we were watching Return of the Jedi and it never gets old. It's always great. Same thing with Empire, same thing with Wrath of Khan. You know, those are seminal movies for me. I grew up with them. I had them on tape. I watched them endlessly, but they still connect. They still work for me. And there are movies like that from every decade. There are movies from every decade, uh, whether it's a handful or whether it's a ton, that I will still go back and enjoy any time. Something about the 80s that really changed. And, of course, I think the 70s influenced a lot of it. But once we got to the 80s, you had a, a synergy that had never been there before between um, advertising and, and soundtracks. And the pop soundtrack became very hot in the 80s. Uh, and you know, you wouldn't go anywhere without hearing like the heat is on and being rem reminded of Beverly Hills cop or, you know, um, take my breath away and being reminded of top gun or the time of my life and remembering dirty dancing. I mean, and La Bamba and all these other movies that had just, just huge soundtracks that were in some cases almost bigger than the films themselves. I mean, of course, flash dance was a huge film, but I mean, the soundtrack was probably even bigger than the film itself. And the same maybe could be said for Footloose. Um, and, and these things along with like franchises that would have uh, toys and all these other things that were coming in. Cause that was another thing that changed in the eighties was the uh, ability to have uh, television shows and movies based on toys and stuff. Like, so we got transformers and of course the era ended with the Ninja Turtles and the Ninja Turtles were almost like a perfect, uh, a perfect franchise to kind of usher in the nineties. They really were, um, even though their roots were deep in the eighties, uh, the, 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 the cartoon picked up in the late eighties. And of course we got the film in 1990, but that really kind of, to me was kicked off the nineties. Uh, and the end of the eighties really was, uh, you know, it wasn't the best of films. 89 was a big year for movies, of course, because of Batman 
And we had a lot of other great films like Indiana Jones and Last Crusade and Lethal Weapon 2 and UHF and, I mean, a tons of sequels like Ghostbusters 2 and a few others I already mentioned, uh, Karate Kid 3. Um, so the 89 was almost like a perfect uh, cap to a lot of the 80s because a lot of films got sequels that year. Um, and then the last film that came out in, in the 1980s, oddly enough, was Tango and Cash with Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell. And that movie is just so quintessential 80s that it's just almost perfect that that film kind of capped off that era. And then, of course, in 1990, like I said, we had Ninja Turtles and Gremlins 2, or Gremlins 2 there, which uh, almost kind of like uh, changed things. And that kind of ushered in a new era. And the 90s were different. The 90s were way different. But, uh, God, that, that, that era from like 70 to to 94 of films, 95 of films is just unbeatable, unbeatable. For me, when I look back, uh, it was the advent of digital effects that kind of, you know, cost the 80s um, because they thought, oh, we're going to make things better, and then they just made things worse. So you immediately, when you look back at gore and horror films, particular sci-fi, you look at some of the bad horrible films that came out in the 90s going into the 2000s and go, man, why can't we have movies like from the 80s? And there you go. There's your answer. It's like, um, it was the end of, of uh, that live action innovation was the 80s. I could even say I wanted to be like Anthony Michael Hall in Breakfast Club because he was so kind of, I don't know, he was honest and open and he he followed his feelings. And I'm like, I want to be like that guy. And if I'm not quite that guy, I want that guy as my best friend. And I think that that was what was so great about the films of the 80s for me is they were showing me the, the, the world I wanted to live in as I grew older, starting out as a preteen, then a teenager, and then a young adult going to college, and then finally out of college and making my way in the real world. I wanted my life to be like an 80s movie with that kind of a soundtrack. And if I wanted to take the day off from work, I wanted Sloan to pick me up. Well, I guess we had to go pick her up, but I wanted to go hang out with Mia Sarah and see what Chicago had to offer. That's the way I wanted my life to be. And I think that's one of the things that people love about 80s movies is 80s movies were all about the way the world that we wished existed was like. And we hope we could live in that world. It was a culture, it was a time, it was uh, a period of growth, but also at the same time, uh, excess and everything that you could think of uh, at everyone's fingertips. And it, it just all kind of got thrown uh, onto the wall and everyone was seeing, okay, what's going to stick? What's going to work? What boundaries can we push? What limits can we uh, blow past? What can we do to really excite and entertain the audience? And it was on multiple levels. You've got that from the guys that are making the biggest mainstream movies ever made. You know, your stuff from Spielberg was huge. I mean, everyone knows how big E.T. was. But then you've got the stuff from like Roger Corman and then Charles Band before he propelled into the 90s with all the full moon movies and everything from uh, his entire, you know, company. And it's, it's just fantastic. You had people who were able to access the means and materials to make their own films before the video era. It really seemed like everything was in place for the most creative movies with the best effects and with the best quality to ever get made. And there were some rough made movies during this time too, but even those are a blast. You look at something like the video dead and it's got this, unbelievably grainy, almost shot on video, like looking a style to it. You know, there are tons of movies from the eighties that look cheap and shoddy, but they're still real sincere and actual weight to them. You know, there are movies in the eighties that have the kind of emotional, uh, everything going on to them that other films from other decades just don't have. Uh, I think people loved making movies in the 80s. People had a blast making films. 
And you really get that whenever you talk to people who were there, that what they were doing was some of their favorite work they've ever done in their entire life. And it shows. It shows when you go back and watch stuff like the 1988 version of The Blob or The Fly with Jeff Goldblum. These are movies that people really put everything into. And they had sometimes the best experience making them and sometimes, you know, really tough times making the films. But at the same time, everyone was fully on board. Everyone was going for it. Everyone was just having uh, a total blast in any way that they could and delivering all that they had to give us a great entertaining experience. So that really comes through in the movies. You really do get a sense that this is sincere, this is honest, this is genuine, and many times it's great. And I love it, you know, again, with horror, with sci-fi, with action, uh, there are so many movies from this decade that even just thinking about them are always fun. And you just go back and you love them. And I think that really works for a lot of people. But you know what? As you watch those movies, the time drifts away. You're almost transported back to that mystical place where you felt good. Everything was fresh and new. And there is a, like I said, it's a warm feeling. It's, it, it's like when, it's almost like when you cross the desert and you find an oasis. You take refuge in that for a little while. And you're thinking, and you get done watching, ah, dude, that was nice, you know. And part of actually the great thing is about now that I'm older is sharing this with other people. I don't have any kids, but I would absolutely love to sit down and if I had a son or a daughter, sit down and watch with them, say, this is Indiana Jones. This is Raiders of the Lost Ark. I saw this when I was your age. Really? You saw this when you were my age? Yeah, yeah. And, and so it's it's that thing too. You know, you're pa it, pa the passing it on to a, 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 a younger generation. and. As I said, you know, it brings you back to this place where everything, you know, the world is a screwed up place, as we all know. But for that brief instant, when you're watching Back to the Future, or you're watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, or you're watching Ghostbusters, or Gremlins, or Trading Places, or E.T., you're transported back to that place, where you, or, you know, or something like, you know, or for your, Bond, I'm a big Bond fan, for your eyes only, or R Return of the Jedi, or The Empire Strikes Back. You know what? For that one instant, everything is right in the world. Everything makes sense. Okay? I'm ready to go back and face whatever harsh realities outside my door again. Because I, I know I, I can hang on to this. And I know that this part is right over here. You know, the heroes are stalwart and true. The good guys win. Everything makes sense in this world. 